Hello, and thank you for attending this talk titled Hydrodynamic Deep Basin Systems and Exploring Downhole Geochemical Interactions in Unconventional Reservoirs. I would like to thank Allison Gibbs and the rest of the Canadian Discovery team for help on this presentation, as well as Dr. Ben Rostron of Isobrine Solutions, who provided us with excellent isotopic material that we will look at towards the end of this presentation. During this presentation, we will take a look at many different aspects of the water story, both in aquifers and conventional reservoirs and unconventional reservoirs, with the goal of circling back as often as possible to how understanding water chemistry can play a role in the Montney formation of Western Canada, particularly in the under-pressured fairway of the Montney, located in Western Alberta as indicated by this blue box here. We will start by looking at a quick overview of Montney hydrodynamics and the deep basin and talking about why water chemistry is important. Then we will move on to standard water chemistry, including screening processes, different analyses, and finishing up with an example of Montney waters in the Elmworth area, which will outline some of the limitations of standard water chemistry in unconventional reservoirs. We will move from there into isotopes, where we will quickly introduce isotopes, go through some case studies, and discuss the benefit of isotopic analysis, especially for answering tough questions that standard water chemistry cannot. We will then wrap everything up with a quick summary. As I'm sure most of you know, the Montney is as prolific as it is complex, but for the purposes of today, we will just quickly go over basic Montney stratigraphy and the main hydrodynamic plate types. The Montney can be split into four zones, the lower, the lower middle, the upper middle, and the upper, and all four zones can be targets for hydrocarbons depending on where you are in the Montney. The Montney can also be split into four main hydrodynamic plate types, which include the overpressure deep basin, the turbidites, the under-pressure deep basin, and the conventional system. When we look at these systems on a map, we can see that the furthest to the west is the overpressure deep basin with red data points, and then the turbidites, which are located in a small geographic area right here and are annotated by the yellow data points. We then have the under-pressure deep basin system through here with the green data points, and finally furthest to the east is the conventional system. When we plot all of this data up on a pressure elevation graph, we can see how these systems differ. The blue line here is the regional water gradient, and as expected, the conventional system sits along that gradient. The turbidites are also more or less normally pressured, with the overpressure deep basin sitting above the regional hydraulic gradient, with pressures much higher than 10 kPa per meter, and oftentimes around or above 15 kPa per meter. And the underpressure deep basin system sits slightly below the regional water gradient. So why is water chemistry important? Water chemistry is important for many reasons, including water chemistry is used to determine correct water density for hydraulic head mapping and pressure gradients, and in turn understanding flow systems, which is obviously a big component of any hydrogeology and hydrodynamic study. It's also important for determining RW, evaluating suitability for potential source water, and evaluating compatibility for potential disposal wells. The next two reasons are the focus of this presentation, which is using water chemistry and isotopic analysis to understand flowback recovery and to determine the contribution from other zones within the Montney Formation. Before using water data, it is important to know how to screen the data and try to determine what is actually representative of formation water. The first step is to remove any incomplete analyses and samples with analytical errors, one of these screens is looking at electroneutrality. There are also different steps to be taken on if the sample is from an aquifer or a conventional reservoir or an unconventional reservoir. In unconventionals, water is no longer the continuous phase, so finding and identifying formation water can be more difficult. And there is an increased concern that the sample will be more representative of frac fluid than formation water. And additional measures need to be taken to monitor flowback over time to understand the tra transition from flowback to formation water. In a conventional aquifer, the better samples are generally taken from DSTs or wells with significant water production and generally have less concern over being a representative sample. In shallow conventional reservoirs or aquifers, for example, multivariant cross plots and piper plots, such as the one here, can help identify different water types and distinguish the water chemistry from local meteoric recharge by identifying different mixing paths where rock fluid interactions change with depth and residence time. 
Stiff diagrams are another popular graphical representation for the major ion composition of water samples. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron are on the left, and chloride, sulfate, carbonate, and bicarbonate are on the right. Different formations and contaminants will have distinct shapes and can be easily picked out. For example, this technique helps to identify contaminants such as corrosion inhibitor, potassium chloride muds, alcohol, gel chem muds, and more. We can see examples of different shapes of these different contaminants here compared to the shape of formation waters down here. With this shape being a typical shape of a formation water, formation waters associated with carbonates and evaporates, and odd formation waters that may be more representative of meteoric recharge. Sampling points also have an effect on the quality of the sample. For example, a DST sample taken closer to the tool at the bottom is generally more representative of formation water than samples taken at the top. We will come back to this idea with an example later on in the presentation. Just like the multivariant plot we introduced in the first water screening slide, we can also use similar plots for deeper formations and unconventional reservoirs. Here we have three plots of sodium chloride ratio versus a magnesium sulfate ratio. These sorts of plots can be useful in identifying characteristic water types and screening out contaminants. For example, the granite wash clearly separates out formation water from the fresh water and mud filtrate dilution trends. One thing to notice for all of these plots is the lower sodium chloride ratio and the higher magnesium sulfate ratio due to the higher amounts of chloride and the higher amounts of magnesium in these deeper zones due to higher salinity and residence time, which is illustrated in the granite wash, the Pekisco, and the Manville brines. In the Manville, we can also see the effect of the meteoric water dilution trend on this plot for areas of the Manville that are connected to surface, with the meteoric water dilution trend going to much higher values for the sodium chloride ratio. We can also see evidence of potential Paleozoic brines mixing with Manville waters in areas where the Manville overlies Paleozoic formations such as the Wabaman. Before we get into what these sorts of multivariant plots look like for the Montney, I just want to take a look at the additional step that needs to be considered when dealing with unconventional reservoirs, which is understanding the frac flowback profile. Because these wells are heavily fracked with waters that are much less saline than true formation water, it is important to track the chemistry of the produced water from the start of production to get a sense of when the water samples may be more representative of true formation water. On this slide, we have a map of Montney total dissolved solids within the underpressured fairway, along with plots of um, TDS over time from on production for three different areas within the underpressured fairway. So we have the Gordondale area, which is up here, Kakwa down here, and Pipestone over here. For all three areas, we can see that the TDS is increasing over time, but the curves flatten at different rates and at different TDSs. Analyzing these can provide some insight into what the true formation water may look like in these different areas. Now we return to similar plots we've already looked at, but here the data is from the Montney. And one of the main things I want to point out is how much less distinct these trends are in an unconventional reservoir. We can still separate out different groupings and identify a dilution trend line, but it is difficult to make too many more conclusions about these graphs. For example, the sodium chloride ratio versus the magnesium sulfate ratio is a figure that we have seen several times at this point in the presentation, and the previous formations all contained relatively strong trends. Here, the plot can be grouped into two different clouds of data based on salinity, but no definitive trends can be observed. So how do we know what is frac fluid, or what is Monte formation water versus out of zone formation water? These questions become more challenging with standard methods when we are working in the unconventional world. In the next slide, we are going to focus on looking at sodium plus chloride and calcium plus magnesium plots like the one here. And we're going to focus on the Elmworth area, which, which data sits about right here on this plot. We are now going to zoom into a single area of the Montney and see what the data might be able to tell us. So to start, we have a plot here with curves from six different areas within the underpressured fairway, and each area has a different water chemistry profile. This could be due to a number of factors, such as just basic differences in the actual true formation water, different downhole chemical interactions that may occur, 
or potential mixing with out-of-zone formation waters. If we now look specifically at the Elmworth data, which are the red data points here, we see that we have an unexpected shift in the data, with part of the curve extending to higher sodium and chloride values. Could this shift be indicative of out-of-zone mixing? If we lay halfway DOIG data from the same area behind the Elmworth data, we can see that the left-hand Elmworth curve is similar to the water samples from the halfway DOIG. And we do know that in this area of the Montney, the Montney can be connected to the overlying halfway formation through either updip connection or connecting through nearby faults or perhaps fracking out a zone. So there is the potential that these samples represent an out-of-zone out influence, but without further analysis, it's difficult to make a conclusive statement about this. Luckily, isotopes can help provide conclusive answers to questions like this. The remainder of the presentation will be focused on isotopes. So to start, analyzing stable isotopes can provide answers when conventional methods fail, like in the example we just discussed. Because stable isotopes like oxygen and hydrogen are affected by meteorological processes, they provide a distinct fingerprint on their origin, which then allows us to more accurately determine true formation water. Oxygen and hydrogen are the most common, but labs will also analyze carbon, sulfur, nitrogen, boron, lithium, chloride, bromine, and strontium. These are all abundant and easy to measure with large mass differences due to natural fractionation processes. To illustrate this process, we have a figure on the right of the global meteoric water line. Research has shown that almost worldwide correlation between hydrogen and oxygen isotope compositions of meteoric waters. The relationship is caused by mass fractionation of the isotopes between the evaporation of seawater and then condensation. The fractionation process is influenced by things like temperature and latitude, for example, cold meteoric water from the Arctic and the Antarctic are more negative than more meteoric water from the tropics. Due to this fractionation process, a global meteoric water line can be built. It is also possible to construct a local meteoric water line that is specific to the isotopic composition for a given area. The meteoric water line is a starting point for many groundwaters and formation waters plot as a basin line off the meteoric water line as demonstrated on this figure here. We are now going to go through a few different examples of how isotopes can be used. This first example is from a well in Saskatchewan and this well has a DST and a series of water samples. So to begin, the DST was performed on the lodgepole formation and recovered 150 meters of fluid. This is a moderate fluid recovery, so it provides inconclusive data. There is also no hydrocarbons recovered on the test, and the handful of samples that were recovered have the following remarks. Sample one was the drilling mud with a chloride concentration of just over 12,000 milligrams per liter. Then we had three samples taken within the DST test, top, middle, and bottom, with chloride concentrations ranging from just over 12,000 to 11,000 milligrams per liter. Sample five was a bottom hole sample with a chloride concentration of 10,700 milligrams per liter and has the remark that it contained 2.4 liters of muddy water. Sample six was not analyzed. If we look at the water analysis a little bit further, the bottom hole sample has the following remarks. A pale, pale yellow colored filtrate recovered from muddy water with a pH of 7.5, a TDS of just over 33,000 milligrams per liter, no carbonate, no hydroxide, and a stiff diagram that looks like the following. Again, it's hard to determine from these remarks and the stiff diagram and just the water chemistry in general, anything conclusive about this sample. Is it true formation water or is it more representative of the drilling mud? We don't know without looking at the water further. So to summarize, both the DST and the water analysis data are inconclusive, but the isotopic analysis completed on the swell is conclusive. We can see from the figure on the right that the deuterium or hydrogen versus oxygen isotope values are significantly different from the drilling mud in the upper right hand corner compared to the bottom hole sample in the bottom left hand corner with the top sample being less representative than the bottom DST sample, as we would expect. 
So in conclusion, the samples did recover significant formation water. The test is in fact a valid lodgepole formation test, and the zone is likely wet. This example demonstrates that even in a conventional example, isotopic analyses will still provide very valuable information for better understanding formation waters. The next example is from the Montney and looks at the frac flowback curve. So once again, when we are dealing with unconventional reservoirs, there's always a question of how much of the produced fluid is frac fluid versus formation fluid. And as we already saw from the previous slide, if the samples continue to be analyzed after the onset of production, we will observe an increase in TDS. We will also observe an increase in the amount of formation water being produced and a decrease in the amount of frac fluid being produced. And the hydrogen and oxygen isotopes will move away from the local meteoric water values, i.e. they will deviate from the local meteoric water line. From looking at all of these, a person could question the need for isotopes as all of the curves are more or less demonstrating the same idea. However, from simply looking at the TDS curve, it is still difficult to, to determine if it is formation water being produced or not. Isotopic analysis was performed on a handful of the samples taken after the on-production date to more accurately determine the evolution from frac fluid to formation fluid. Here we can see the local meteoric water line and the isotopic analysis of the provided frac fluid, an interpreted value for the actual frac fluid that was likely used, and a series of analyses that demonstrate the flowback evolution from frac fluid towards formation waters as the values deviate further and further from the local meteoric water line. The last isotopic example is once again from the Montney, showing a similar local meteoric water line. Montney samples in the blue squares here, Beloy samples in the red squares, and samples from a producing well here with the green diamonds. If we think back to the Montney halfway example from earlier, we surmise that there may have been influence from the halfway on the Montney due to deviation in chemistry curves, but we couldn't make a conclusive statement due to the large amount of scatter in the data. Here, with isotopic data, we have Montney end-member samples and Beloy end-member samples, and we can make a more definitive statement that the samples here are in fact showing waters that have mixing between the Montney and the Beloy. So in summary, water chemistry is important for understanding flowback recovery and determining contributions from other zones. Traditional screening and analytic methods include determining water types through things like piper plots, stiff diagrams, and multivariant cross plots. These methods generally work well for aquifers and conventional systems, but the process becomes more muddied when dealing with unconventional reservoirs like the Montney. Standard water chemistry is cost effective and can usually provide part of the answer. But in order to delve deeper and provide more conclusive answers, isotopic analysis is needed. This includes things such as determining true formation waters from the frac fluid and comparing in zone and out of zone formation water. These things are important to understand because operators will want to know if they are fracking out of zone so they can adjust their operations or better understand the true formation chemistry to ensure the frac fluid and subsequent downhole interactions are not impeding production due to things like scaling. With that said, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention, and also give a big thank you to the team at Canadian Discovery. Please, while there's still some time, drop by our booth and download a copy of our mini digest poster featuring Western Canada plays. This presentation will be available to download on our website, and we have a much more in-depth version of this presentation that we'd be happy to do for your company, so please contact our sales staff. And again, thank you to my colleagues at Canadian Discovery, as well as Ben Rostron from Isobrine Solutions, and I will now try to answer any questions that there may be.